show you and talk, but we don't have a lot of time to do it. So I just want to say good morning. Thank you for all being here. This is the largest panel I've ever seen that I've ever been a part of. Um, this is special for me because many years ago, 1990 uh, to be exact, um, right before Christmas, I left on what would become a great adventure of uh, filming the very first, what I call the very first G.I. Joe mini movie, but I even like what Carson calls it, the first live action micro movie. So um, uh, we're going to get started. Carson's going to uh, kind of ask me a few questions. We'll introduce some of the segments. This footage that we're going to see has not been seen, even by me. <laughs> Since I shot it in 1990. So I just turned over a bunch of Sony 8 millimeter videotapes and said, Carson, I have no idea what's on these tapes. And I said, but I, they're, they're labeled G.I. Joe uh, live action commercial. And he took it from there. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and it was, it's just been, you know, a, a great uh, relationship that we've struck up over the last few years. And when I found out what he did for a living, I said, he's the man. That's right. So, Thank you. with that, we start. Awesome. Thank you, Kurt. And uh, I, I really just feel a tremendous amount of respect for him. The lifelong uh, love. G.I. Joe, even well after he left Hasbro, this guy is the biggest advocate for G.I. Joe, and that's the thing that impresses me, impressed me about him the most, is he's so willing to talk to any and all of us. So we don't have a lot of time, we got a lot to get through, so I'm going to keep it moving. We'll just click through the first few uh, slides, it'll say 1982, 1983, 1984. Uh, my clicker doesn't reach, so a big thanks to Jesse for helping out, and thanks to the Triangle Joes for filming this, and we'll put this on YouTube later for the folks that couldn't make it. Thank you, guys. So 1982, we started out with uh, obviously in a, in animated intros and live action scenes of kids playing with toys, and we also had product shots in the studio. We'll go to 83, and we continued that formula for 83. We'll go to 84. We continued the formula for 84. Not a lot of changes going on. Still, the primary voices were a voiceover narrator, voice of God kind of thing, and the kids playing with the toys, narrating how much fun they were having. We'll keep going. And then we added the kids into the live action product shots, which was very interesting, kind of micro kids inside of a big scene. So this was a ton of fun. This was envisioning yourself in the vehicles, playing with the vehicles, interacting with the vehicles for the first time. So this just woke my imagination. I wanted to ask Kurt first question. Did this lead into the Live the Adventure theme in 1986? Because this very much spoke to living the adventure. Yeah, that's exactly what Bob out of this was, you know, the fact that we'd actually now we're showing commercials with kids interacting. I mean, in the lower left, you see the kids on the flight deck with the sky striker. Um, so you did you imagine yourself as part of the G.I. Joe team being on board a ship, and definitely it led to that whole idea of live the adventure. So the 86 catalog, you got the awkward kid in the corner that's going into the very dangerous wooded scene with the G.I. Joe's, and they're like, what's that kid doing there? I'm like, he's living the adventure. <laughs> that's where this started, the whole living the adventure thing. Started in 85 a year earlier with putting kids in the scene. So we'll keep going to 86. So we introduced some 3D animation kind of modeling here at the beginning of the commercial to show this kind of Tron-looking wireframe around the vehicles before it transformed into the real vehicle and took up and took flight. We also introduced the first live-action actor, which was Sergeant Slaughter. But I will say the Sergeant Slaughter scene was basically him walking up out of the jungle set and saying a couple lines. So it wasn't storytelling at this point. We'll go to the next one. Then we introduced a second style of animation, which is the more watercolor kind of. This is called rotoscoping. You shoot the vehicles and then you draw over them and that creates a rotoscope animation style. So there are now two animation styles. You have the traditional sunboat cartoon and then you have the rotoscope more watercolor look. That will only last for a couple of years. We also still had the 3D wireframe, but now the 3D wireframe was color. So we'll keep going. Oh, you had the bridge up there, live action too. So we're gonna hit the button to the right and play one of these commercials. <coughs> Second 
live action character, the bridge. The first one is on the left. I think we might have clicked past it, and that's totally fine because we're short on time. We'll put it online. Um, so let's look to the next slide. That shows around the big forest camp. That shows Sergeant Slaughter. He's joined the G.I. Joe team, so we're celebrating by giving away Sergeant Slaughter action figures. But you can't buy them in stores. You've got to earn them. Here's how. Go to Clive Sergeant Slaughter certificates or call the number on the certificate, and Sergeant Slaughter will tell you how to get in on the action with only four certificates. There's a $1 entry charge. See details in specially marked packages. G.I. Joe. Nobody takes on Jovers better than Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. So, so you'll notice he has like one or two lines and he's just stepping forward from a jungle. So that was it for live action. Let's keep going. Alright, so 87 we had still the two animation styles, the sunbow style and the rotoscope kind of watercolor textury looking one. We'll keep going. And then we introduced the first live action commercial. This isn't a micro movie, this isn't as exhaustive as what Kurt did for a month of his life and put his marriage in danger for in 1991. <laughs> this is just a much smaller commercial, so we'll show this one. Look happy then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a whole other 
parts. Yeah. 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 All right, so we'll, get, we'll jump into the next Here's slide. The this is an introduction uh, from Kirk showing you guys around the facility. We'll hit next again. G.I. Joe. Day one. Ice cream this is a portion of the paralyzer that we use in a paint sequence later on. So it's tracks. This is one of the G.I. Joe battle copies. Finishing touches being put on to the colors and almost ready to fly. So over in the corner there, the badger, and a wheel from the badger which will be attached to it. This is our G.I. Joe arsenal. And all kinds of guns. This is the backdrop. It's about 150 feet long. That's the largest uh, sky ever done for any G.I. Joe commercial, certainly for most of any commercial ever done. Here we are creating the uh, miniature world in G.I. Joe. The most impressive set is this over his temple of moon. So I said, show me a budget. Don't just tell me it's going to be too expensive. Show me a budget. Because I knew how expensive the animation was. Okay? So about a month later, um, this is early summer of 1990, um, Joe comes into us, with, into a meeting with me, and he says, said, we have a way we think we can shoot this commercial and make it on budget. We have to go away and shoot all every single commercial in one shoot. Now ordinarily what we did is we'd do three or four commercials, come back home, relax for a, for a couple of months, go up to another location, do three or four commercials. This time we had to shoot, I think it was a dozen 
commercials all at one time to maximize the use of the studio. So that's just a little background on, on how this evolved. So Great. thank you. So the way that it's organized going forward, you'll see footage from behind the scenes of the making of a specific commercial. Then you'll see a very new master that just came off a of VHS master. I wish we had beta or something, but it's a VHS master and a DVD master of the first four live action commercials. Happy to supply this to anybody and everybody. Uh, I would say uh, Yojo uh, just worked with Declassified to uh, give out a hard drive this morning full of TV commercials. I'm partnering with Yojo to share all of our TV files uh, across both of our platforms. We work together in the benefit of the brand. So these commercials will be going out on Yojo's channels and, and my 3D Joe's channels as well. So you'll be seeing those. So we're going to go ahead and start the first commercial here. Okay, here we go. Set, very quiet. All right, roll tape. Camera. Action. Action. Get me that camera. This was all new territory for John Sterner and his crew. He had never done a commercial like this before. And so all the effects that you see in this commercial, the explosions, everything is done what they call via practical effects. There's no computer animation in these commercials. This is all using the old-fashioned squibs and explosive squibs. We had to have an armorer on the set, a guy who knew how to ex you know, set up explosive charges so that they could safely go off. And that'll, I'm sure you have sometimes. Footage. Yeah, sometimes. Because I'm sure you're going to show footage of when it didn't happen so safely. That's right. 
and that involved him. <laughs> All right, so uh, these slides will be on the extended video. But basically, Chris Perlotta obviously did the voice of the uh, Cobra Commander, so that's why you heard the, the beep, 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 and then the actor took off, because he was uh, acting to Chris Perlotta's voice. Uh, he's Roger Cross, who played Cobra Commander. He went on to be a very, very successful actor, according to uh, Ren Roberts, who's the Duke in the commercials. He says he's the one that really blew up and did some things, so a lot of TV shows and commercials. So we'll keep going. All right, so the end of the Paralyzer commercial had Duke in a very perilous situation falling off the side of the mountain. And the next time we saw him was at the beginning of the Air Commandos commercial, and he's fighting in a, like a puddle of Toxo sludge. So we didn't know what happened there. It was nonlinear, and that really bothered me. So we started searching. Let's go to the next slide. And I obviously started with Yojo. I uh, looked at my playlist. We didn't have the answer. What was that gap in the middle? So uh, thanks to Mr. Adam Riches and also Kirk Bazigian sending the new masters, we have found the missing second commercial. <laughs> Never seen before. Oh. All right, so the mystery character that was in all of this footage that I knew there was a second commercial for was this guy, Major Altitude, very, uh, very nice costume. We'll keep going. <laughs> and this will be the behind the scenes footage of this commercial followed by the new master. Here comes G.I. Joe Battle Cop. 
backstory to this one. Hasbro was fined $25,000 by the FTC for running this commercial. And um, because Mattel complained that one of the shots in this commercial could never have been done, and they were right, um, where you saw the two helicopters collide, we could never have, we could never get that to happen by a kid pulling the zip cord. So we rigged it because it had added to the drama and sense of the commercial. Now, maybe after a thousand tries, kids could do it, and that was our justification. Sure, a kid could do it, okay? But for the commercial, we didn't have a thousand tries, okay? So we rigged it. And um, uh, I will go down in infamy for many other things in Hasbro as well, but for this uh, commercial. So, uh, they also had to use a prototype Duke because there wasn't a current Duke at the time, so I thought it would be fun to show that green foil painted prototype with the Duke head on it. We'll keep moving. Um, this was the mystery character. There is the mystery rigged uh, battle copter. So there was actually a battery in there uh, that kept the rotor moving, and it was suspended from fishing poles uh, to have the illusion that it's flying itself, but really they were moving it with fishing poles, so that's how they were able to uh, capture the impossible. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And this is where they got sued. Next slide. <laughs> and this explains a little bit about uh, why they got sued. So, a little more detail. Next slide. Okay, so this is the uh, behind the scenes footage of the next commercial, followed by the new master of the next commercial. Ready and action. Duke beats help. Send to the air commando. Here's our Cobra Sky Creeper, all suited up and ready to go into combat. We've all been wondering how exactly this was going to work. You should know in a few minutes. said no to anything. And when you see him fighting in that water, this was filmed in Vancouver, Canada. Um, it was filmed in a studio that was unheated on December 13th. Okay. The water in that swimming pool was about 35 degrees. Okay. And he did about seven or nine takes, I forget how he kept, and he never said no. John kept saying, Another one, another one, another one, and he'd keep doing it. Get into a new, clean change of clothes, and drop them in there, and you'd get soaked and wet. Never, never a complaint. They only had two or three costumes, and so they'd throw the costume in a dryer, put them in the other costume. Uh, for this scene, his hair was already wet because he's jumping up out of the puddle, but for the other scene where he wrecked the battle copter, they had to take 30 <coughs> minutes between each take so that they could fix his perfect hair. <laughs> First scene that didn't make the commercial, uh, Duke is in trouble, call in the air commandos. They made up a joke about him. They were like, Duke is in trouble, call in the hair commandos. <laughs> so they had some fun picking. 
looking at his perfect hair. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was how dangerous the shoot was. Uh, on the last explosion with Night Vulture, I think that's Night Vulture's Air Commando uh, glider, the last explosion didn't blow up. It actually blew the wing apart. So you can see holes in the top right corner up there, and that was the last take, and they were done. We were done. I'll yeah. tell you, the director sounded nervous. He was like, cut! <laughs> it was a little perilous. The other thing was, uh, when Kirk was driving in the battle wagon, it literally caught fire while he's in there. The back end of this thing. Kirk, you want to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, um, we, we didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> so we couldn't hire extras. So everybody on the shoot was pressed into service as extras, unpaid, by the way. And, because uh, there's no SAG up in Canada at the time. I don't even know if there is today. Anyway, I was the driver of the battle wagon, so they suited me up. Ren's on the outside uh, manning the machine gun, and I'm in the cage driving. And they had to lock that cage because um, it was on a, a rolling thing that made the battle wagon look, it was, look like it was going up and down, and you didn't want the cockpit cage to flap, so it was locked down. And you can see in the commercial, you'll see Squibs machine gun fire go across the outside of the battle wagon. Uh, we did this about three times, and on the third take, um, the explosions went off. Now, that's made out of plywood. That, that battle wagon was made out of like quarter-inch plywood. On the last take, I hear John Sterner yell, It's on fire! Get him out! <laughs> and I'm looking around going, what is he talking about? Sure enough, the back half of the battle wagon was burning on fire. <laughs> audience, she's got a shocked look on her face. She never knew that story. <laughs> Alright, so this is behind the scenes footage for the next commercial, followed by the commercial. Ready, and action! You can see how uh, yeah, bubbling, Foxo, Foxo Sludge good. is. Bottom bubbling is good. A little more smoke. Take, bubbles on, bubbles on, then dry ice in. Ready, Jake? When we run the camera, you stop pulling. Camera, rolling. Ready, action! Pour it! Action! Pour! Good, great. Uh, they're set on the other end. One more. This is an air cannon, which is going to help cause some of the explosions. And that thing up top is what's going to blow up when we actually destroy the Cobra Toxo Sludge Factory. This is what the tanks look like. Step around to the back. That's an air cannon that's going to blow the roof off. This is Alan, our pyrotechnics and special effects master. Ready? <laughs> Here's a look at the carnage left from the explosion. This is our G.I. Joe brawler. You can see the battle damage. It's a little more than I would think a real brawler would take, but it works for the commercial. Uh, Polar ice cave that Duke is going to run through. This is our set from last week. Here's uh, our hero Duke playing with his M16. <laughs> don't be held that little plasma tox. The next time you get a McDonald's milkshake, realize you're drinking plasma tox. <laughs> because that's what goes into a McDonald's milkshake, that clear 
It's actually plastic, is what they call it. And then they mix it with uh, flavoring and coloring. That's a McDonald's milkshake. So the lesson of the day is don't drink McDonald's milkshakes. Or enjoy your glass of plasma tops. <laughs> so we'll keep moving to the next commercial. Still, we're still celebrating it here 25 years later. And we're still married, happily. 
footsteps. He's aiming his films and finding the final X that our spin our short things this production has again. <laughs> Not if they put us through this hell. War is hell. We found that out making this shoot this year. Next year, we've got all the bugs out. Next year, we'll even do it better. Tim? <laughs> So the final curtain rings down on the uh, 1991 G.I. Joe production. We get a panoramic view of the studio once again as we finally break down on the final day of shooting. Our home for the last three and a half weeks. So that's, there's a lot more footage and we'll post all of it. Uh, I'll let Kurt finish up. Now, it was just, like I say, it was, it was a disrupting kind of commercial. We did it for the next couple of years. Um, it rejuvenated the G.I. Joe brand. Um, G.I. Joe, I believe, had been down as low as $89 million in sales um, when I came back on the brand in 1989, coincidentally. And with this series of commercials, the brand shot back up to $115 million. That's just domestic sales. That wasn't global sales. Because we weren't a global company at that time. We had G.I. Joe in various countries, but they were under license. So we were getting royalties for their sales. We weren't getting their actual sales only. Um, so that, that it was just an amazing shoot. Made a lot of good life and time friendships on that shoot with the uh, people involved. Um, Willie Suarez, Tim Spidell, Jay Bacall, who was responsible for all the Sunbow animation. He's in this, uh, at this shoot. And the other interesting thing is, um, all, every other shoot I had ever been on, either Tom Griffin or Joe Bacall was on the shoot as support. Neither one ever came to these shoots. They, and that was a sign of confidence that they had in us and the team developing and, you know, uh, filming these commercials. So those guys, John Sterner, his Firehouse Films uh, crew, they were spectacular. Like I say, John had never ever done theatrical, if you will, post kind of a shoot before. Um, we spent months, literally from, as I recall, from July until November uh, doing pre-production meetings every couple of weeks in New York. How are we going to film plasma talks? How are we going to do the, simulate the explosions? How are we going to do all these stunts? Um, who's going to do the costuming? I mean, all the things that go into doing a real movie were things we had to think about and sort out. And so it was a, a, an incredible experience. I'm glad Carson put it all together because otherwise these little Super 8 uh, Sony cassettes would still be collecting dust in my basement. So uh, I wanted to share with you people. So thank you all. It's wall to wall.